Yes, Gawa. <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve Kaler. The Technical Training Department of Yaskawa America Incorporated presents adding and configuring Yaskawa drives in a Profibus network. Profibus is a popular device level network for industrial automation. The drives and automation components made by Yaskawa support Profibus protocols in full and are completely Profibus compatible. In fact, we've gone beyond simple compatibility to make Yaskawa products easy to add to a Profibus network. Now, one reason for the popularity of Profibus is that it's open source. This means that networking specifications are open for use by any manufacturer who wants to create Profibus compliant products. The protocol is managed by Profibus, Profinet International, a global network of vendors, developers, system integrators, and end users that keep it effectively up to date. Yaskawa products, including drives, servos, and motion control devices, serve as slaves on the Profibus network. Devices on a Profibus network communicate back and forth with a network master, which is usually a PLC or an industrial computer. Yaskawa doesn't sell devices that could be used as a network master, so we can't help with every possible network problem, but our technical support engineers are very willing to help you apply Yaskawa Drive to a Profibus network. A communication option card will be necessary if you want to network a Yaskawa Drive with Profibus. The SIP3 option card is needed for an A1000 drive, and the V1000 and V1004X drives require an SIP3V option card. The option card plugs into the CN5A connector on the A1000 drive and the CN5 connector for the V1000 and V1004X. The option card kit contains the Profibus interface board along with ground wires that should be attached to the earth ground terminal of the drive. Now there are a few steps that need to be addressed before connecting the drive to the Profibus network. We recommend putting the drive through its standard setup procedure before connecting it to a Profibus network. Setup should include a test run initiated using the drive keypad. A successful startup means the drive is functioning properly and you can be sure that any downstream operation issues are traceable to the network rather than to the functioning of the drive itself. Some programming of the drive is needed if you want a drive to operate through Profibus. The drive must be programmed to accept run commands and speed commands through the optional Profibus board. Set parameters B101 and B102 to a setting of 3 option PCB which in our case is the Profibus option card. The F6 group is used to set the drive's communication parameters. Use F630 to set the Profibus node address. Select the data format you'd like to use in F632. Choose either a PPO type or a conventional format. When you set parameter F630 to select your Profibus node address, it is important to note that there are some limitations to the variety of address options you can use. There are 126 unique addresses on a Profibus network. It is common practice to leave network address 0 open for the computer that will do the network configuration. It is also common practice to keep node 126 free. This allows devices that have no mode for setting a node address DIP switches would be one example, to be safely attached to the network without causing a conflict. The address 127 is used as a way of making broadcast messages that will be received by all nodes on the network. Now before continuing, cycle the drive's power. Cycling the power to the drive is essential after making a change to the drive's communication parameters. Cycling causes the drive's communication parameters to take effect. If the power is not cycled, the change will not take effect and the drive will not be able to properly communicate with the network. Once the drive has been properly configured and the power has been cycled, it's time to plug in to the network. Wiring of the option card to the network should only be done using Profibus specified cables. Most networks will make use of the standard DB9 connector. 
If the connector is manufactured for a Profibus network, a terminating resistor may be built in. If the drive is at either end of a segment, the terminating resistor needs to be turned on. There is an important exception. If the network baud rate is greater than 1.5 megabits per second, then active termination will need to be used at both ends of each segment. If you use an active terminating module, like the Siemens model shown, the terminating resistor must be turned off. Active termination is also recommended if there is a need to maintain the operation of the network when there's a failure in the device with the terminating resistor. Active termination is built into all repeaters, so a termination module isn't always necessary. Successful functioning of a Profibus network relies upon proper grounding for each network drive. The option card's blue ground wire is then connected to the drive's ground. The drives themselves should be grounded to the single ground point of the system. Now that the drive is connected to the network, we will need to configure the network so that it can communicate with the drive. To accomplish this in Profibus, we will use an engineering tool supplied by the controller's manufacturer. An engineering tool is a software program run on a computer connected to the network. The engineering tool can be used to configure or program devices on the network. Engineering tools are available from the manufacturers of the controller. Since Profibus is commonly used on Siemens PLCs, we will use a Siemens S7 PLC and their engineering tool, Sematic Manager, to configure the network. If we want to add the drive onto the network, we'll need to use a data file called a GSD file. The GSD file is a text file that contains all the appropriate information about a device. Any GSD file can be opened and modified with Microsoft Notepad, WordPad, or any other standard text editor. A GSD file for a device contains all of its operating data. The firmware of the drive's option card has some limited data, including vendor ID, device ID, firmware revision, or device type. The network may be able to identify a device from its firmware data, but a GSD file allows a network to fully identify a device and access its functions. All Yaskawa GSD files are downloadable from the yaskawa.com website. They can also be found at profibus.com. Now, a single GSD file will work for any size or model of Yaskawa drive that you have in the network. And here's a typical name for a GSD file. The naming convention is simple. The file name is the first four letters of the vendor plus the vendor ID for the device. The GSD file will begin with a complete rundown of all the pertinent information regarding the drive and option card. Once we're sure we have the correct GSD file, we can use the engineering tool to add the drive onto the network. Before we begin, be sure the drive is connected and powered up. Before you can add a Yaskawa drive to a Profibus network, you must first configure the drive's Profibus master. Since this process falls outside the scope of this discussion, we won't cover it here. For details on accomplishing this step, refer to document AN dot AFD dot 30 on the Yaskawa website. So, once the master is configured, we will need to add your drive as its slave. Select SIP3 Profibus DP interface card from the list of potential slaves. Click on the slave you wish to add, then drag it onto the network configuration to add it to the network. Now that the drive is on the network, we can begin configuring how the slave will communicate to the master. As soon as you add the drive onto the network, a properties window will appear. Select the Profibus address for the node that was programmed in F630 of the drive. Next, select the Profibus network the node will be used on. If a network layout schematic exists, refer to it when selecting the appropriate address. Okay, the next step is selecting the I.O. that we wish to use. There are eight total I.O. options to choose from. Your choices will depend on the I.O. type that you selected in parameter F632, either Yaskawa or PPO. For Yaskawa I.O. types, there is a basic, extended data 1, and extended data 2. 
For PPO, there are five choices, PPO1 through 5. The Yaskawa I.O. types are configured specifically to be used with Yaskawa drives. Yaskawa's basic data configuration will specify six bytes of data to be sent from the master to the drive, and six bytes of data that will be sent back from the drive to the master. The data sent from the master to the drive is referred to as output. Output data will include the run operation information, the command frequency reference, and a torque reference. In return, information sent from the drive to the master is referred to as the input. Inputs include two bytes of drive status, two bytes of the frequency monitor, and two bytes of the measured output current. Selecting the Extended Data 1 configuration increases our input and output message size to 32 bytes, allowing us more flexibility and access to the drive's parameters. Extended Data 1 includes things like torque compensation, analog output levels, and control of the digital outputs. With this format, the master can write up to four consecutive drive parameters. The drive can also send a read request of up to four consecutive parameters as well. Information sent from the drive back to the master is also expanded when using Extended Data 1. Drive status information, like a pulse generator's pulse count and a level of the analog input channel, is included. If the master sent a read request for parameter status with its message to the drive, the drive status information sent back will also include the information read from the specified parameters. This added information includes a trade-off. Larger messages require longer transmission times especially when the network is using slower baud rates. It is best to use the smallest data format that can possibly include all of the necessary application data. The amount of information transferred by the Extended Data 2 format lies somewhere in between the Basic and Extended Data 1 formats. The Extended Data 2 format sends 12 bytes of data from the master to the drive and 12 bytes back from the drive to the master. The first four bytes of computer data specify the run operation bits and the frequency reference. And the first four bytes of input data deliver the drive status bits and the current output frequency. The last eight bytes of the input data allow reading or writing of one drive parameter. The drive answers back with the value of the parameter if the command is a read command or a command response if the command was a write command. PPO data types are defined through ProfiDrive and apply to any ProfiBus network device. All devices that conform to ProfiDrive will have the same PPO data structure. Each PPO differs in size and the information that is transmitted. What is common is that all will contain at least two PZD, or process variables. Specifically, they will all contain the control word for start and stop of the drive and frequency reference word, which is used to assign the speed of the drive from the PLC. For the input words to the PLC, it will contain the status word for the status of the drive and frequency output word for the drive's output speed. PPO1 contains the two PZDs along with the PKW, which is used for parameter read and write. PPO2 contains six PZDs along with the PKW. The extra four PZDs are configurable and can be programmed to be a parameter or monitor in the drive. Because the input and output are independent of each other, you can fully customize the data that is read from the drive and written to the drive via the PZD. PPO3 contains only the two PZDs. PPO4 contains only six PZDs. PPO5 is the largest and contains 10 PZDs along with the PKW. Now that you have a better understanding of the different data formats to choose from, let's return to the process of network configuration. Select the preset configuration format that best suits your application needs based on the data type selected in F632. Click and drag the desired I.O. into the data table. If Extended Data 1 was selected as the preset configuration, separate rows will appear for the input and output.
The input ID will be 16AI and the output ID will be 16AO. The address will be automatically assigned to the input and output, which can be seen in the I address column for input and Q address column for output. Now that the configuration is finally set, we need to compile the configuration so that it can be loaded into the PLC. To do this, we pull down the File menu and select Save and Compile. This saves the configuration onto our computer and compiles the configuration so that it can be downloaded from the computer into the PLC. Our compiled file can now be used to download into the PLC. Go to PLC and click Download to start the download into the PLC. The next step would be to create a variable table to test communications. Open the Insert menu in the Engineering tool. Now go to Insert, then to S7 block, then to Variable Table. Name the variable table and click OK to create it. Now we're going to populate the table and create specific commands for devices in our network. There are two types of variables. PIW variables are inputs from a device in the network to the PLC and PQW variables are outputs from the PLC to another device in the network. From the perspective of the PLC, it's PQW out PIW in. The first step in populating the table is to click Insert and select Range of Variables. Select the starting address, PIW for input, the number of variables to display from that point, and the display format. Click OK and repeat the steps for populating the table with output data or PQW. To see the data from the drive, simply click Variable on the main menu, then Monitor from the drop-down menu to accomplish this. The tool will now be connected to the drive and you will be able to read and write data to the drive. At this point, you're done with the engineering tool. You're configured, you are communicating with the drive, and you know that your configuration is working. The drive in your Profibus network should now be fully functional. If this isn't the case, use the following troubleshooting techniques to find out why. Now, before you begin, here's a word of warning. Troubleshooting electrical equipment should be done with personal safety in mind and should only be performed by qualified personnel. Begin your troubleshooting routine by making sure that all the network cables are plugged in securely and that there is no noticeable damage in a cable or a connector. You may also need to check the cabling for breaks inside the cabling insulation. A simple check with a cable continuity tool is likely to uncover any wire breaks. Improper grounding of a device on the network might also be the problem. Checking the grounding with an oscilloscope can sometimes reveal a very noisy ground connection that could be causing problems. The oscilloscope isn't a perfect solution, however, because using a scope to check a ground can be difficult. A slow scope of 300 MHz or slower is unlikely to yield any useful information. As an alternative, try checking the following four conditions that might be the source of the ground trouble. Make sure the drive is grounded at the cabinet with a star washer. Run copper from the drive directly to the single point ground of the network. If there are multiple cabinets or machine sections, it may be necessary to use a copper braid between the cabinets themselves. Check that the building's ground rod installation meets specifications and local code. In some cases, Noises cannot be eliminated, or a suitable ground cannot be made. In instances like these, a ferrite filter may be effective for cleaning up some of the noise and solving intermittent problems. Now, grounding isn't the only problem that can make troubleshooting necessary. An improper or old GSD file in the engineering tool can misconfigure the communication between the drive and the network, which could lead to a malfunction. 
The existing file must be changed, not simply overwritten. The process for doing this varies from one engineering tool to the next. If the problem can't be traced to grounding or an inconsistency in the GSD file, try a few other physical installation checks. Make sure that the option card is firmly seated in the drive option board port. You may want to reseat it just to be sure. If the drive doesn't seem to run correctly when prompted by the master, the settings of the reference and run source parameters B101 and B102 should be checked. Incorrect parameters will cause the drive to ignore any run commands from the master. Check the frequency reference command and the run command. Also, make sure the network parameters, node address, and data types have been set to the proper values for your network. If the parameters are not set correctly, the drive will not successfully accept commands or run at the intended speed. Checking the addressing of nodes is also an important part of troubleshooting. Check the configuration tool to make sure that the address assigned to the Yaskawa Profibus DP interface matches the drive setting in F630. If the address does not match, messages sent from the master will be ignored by the Yaskawa drive. Duplicate addresses on a Profibus network are not allowed, which can also cause a failure of communication. The configuration tool will generally prevent duplicate addresses from being generated during the network setup process, but duplicates may accidentally be set up through programming. Another network check is to make sure that there are less than 32 devices on each segment of the network, and remember that repeaters, masters, and configuration tools are also considered devices on the segment. The wiring of a Profibus network can also be a source of potential problems and should be examined thoroughly as part of your troubleshooting process. So, begin this process by checking all the network communications. A simple tug on a conductor is enough to tell whether it is securely attached. Also, check to make sure that each conductor is attached to the proper terminal of the DB9 connector. It is also wise to make sure that none of the cabling is broken within the cabling insulation. A basic continuity check of each conductor is likely to catch most breaks. On a Profibus network, make sure that there is at least one meter of cable between any two devices in the network, including drop and stub lines. If the drive is going to be commanded and run by the master, be sure that the drive parameters determining the run and reference source are properly set for the option board. Routing of the low voltage Profibus wiring can also be very important. Make sure that all Profibus wiring is kept at least 4 inches away from any high voltage or high frequency carrying conductors. If the Profibus wire must cross high voltage or high frequency wires, make sure that it does so at a 90 degree angle. If a device or a conductor can be the source of spikes or surges, you may want to keep the Profibus wire even further away, as much as 10 inches or more. It is important to connect the shield wire at each end of a segment to ground and to make sure that the shields are connected serially between the ends of the segments. To prevent current from running between devices of different potentials, a ground wire should be run from each device on the network to a single point ground. Signal reflections on the network wiring can cause intermittent communication errors, just as noise can. A signal reflection can be caused by an impedance mismatch between cables used on the network, by stub or drop lines that are longer than the system allows, or by a lack of termination resistors. Reflections can also result when less than one meter of cable length is used between devices on the network. A connection capacitance that is larger than the maximum allowed can also lead to reflections, and so can a miswired or poorly attached connection at any of the network nodes. The Profibus LEDs MS and NS are both a troubleshooting tool and a point of access to determine system functioning. Check the status of these LEDs which are visible through the cover of the drive. The MS light indicates module status, the NS light is network status. 
Complete information on interpreting the meaning of the LEDs is in the technical manual that came with your SIP3 option card. In the same way, the LCD display of your Yaskawa drive can offer information on communication faults that can be valuable for troubleshooting. Monitors U698 and U699 are particularly useful in detecting the cause of communication errors. Further information on fault codes is contained in the SIP3 technical manual. Now, if none of these troubleshooting steps have yielded a successful resolution to a network problem, the source of difficulty might be outside of the Yaskawa drive and its option card. To further explore issues connected with the Profibus network, the Profibus website is a good place to begin. Check it out at profibus.com, the internet home of the network's governing organization. Thank you for viewing this Yaskawa e-learning module. We really appreciate that you've taken the time to learn more about our products and how to make the most of their many features. For further training or information, contact us by phone at 1-800-YASKAWA, visit us at yaskawa.com, or send us an email, training at yaskawa.com. Yaskawa. It's personal. Thanks for watching.